One of the many qualities that makes pro wrestling a <clears throat> unique industry in the entertainment sphere is the blurred line between what happens behind the camera and what happens in front. For decades, owners of wrestling companies have positioned themselves as on-screen antagonists or protagonists, and for far longer, grapplers running their own promotions have booked themselves to be main attractions. Let's be honest, who wouldn't? If I was in charge, guess who'd beat the streak, go over Cena and, sod it, become champ in the same night at WrestleMania. Those sort of developments aren't always bad, however, sometimes ego gets in the way of sensible booking. Now, who does that remind me of? With that in mind, I'm Adam Wilborn from What Culture, and these are 10 wrestling bookers who made themselves world champion. Hey guys, just before we begin our list, I just want to talk to you about an ambitious RPG project that is taking the world by storm. Raid Shadow Legends. It's immersive, exciting, it looks incredible, and the best part is, is that it's totally free. Now, Raid has all the features you'd expect from a top-class RPG title, like an amazing storyline, awesome 3D graphics, giant boss fights, PvP battles, and hundreds of champions to customize and collect. It's honestly weird to think that I can fit all of this into a smartphone. I mean, look at the crazy level of detail they put into the champions. Raid is getting real big, real fast, and there's a special launch tournament with crazy in-game prizes and real-life physical prizes to be won. But we're going to get you started on the right foot and give you a head start because, well, we're nice like that. So all you've got to do is go to the description, download Raid using our links, and you'll get 50,000 silver straight away alongside a free epic champion courtesy of the dev team and their new player program. And trust me, you're going to need all the help you can get as these PvP battles are fierce. So use our links, gear up, and get stuck in. And I will see you on the battlefield. Number 10, Giant Baba. A pupil of Japanese wrestling hero Ricky Dozan, Giant Baba, soon became a legend in his own right because, well, look at the bloody size of him. After Ricky Dozan's murder and the subsequent decline of the Japan Wrestling Association, Baba formed his own outfit, All Japan Pro Wrestling. AJPW joined New Japan Pro Wrestling, both formed in 1972, as one of the two major promotions in the country. Baba, a proven star who challenged for both the NWA and WWE world titles in the US, was a clear choice to hold All Japan's top title, the Pacific Wrestling Federation World Heavyweight Championship. After all, are you going to argue with this guy? Not only was Baba the inaugural champion, but he'd hold the belt another three times in the 70s and 80s for a total of more than 10 cumulative years. Number 9. Orville Brown when a group of regional promoters came together to recognize a single world champion in 1948, their choice was Midwest Wrestling Association champion Orville Brown. Brown had captured several titles and beaten many respected competitors, making him a prime choice for the first National Wrestling Alliance World Heavyweight Champion. Of course, the fact he was one of the group of promoters in her either. Brown continued to unify the NWA title with others around the country, including the original AWA Championship. He was collecting belts like bloody Dean Ambrose. By the time Brown was forced to forfeit the belt after sustaining career-ending injuries in a car accident, it was considered one of the world's major wrestling championships. And for that, he goes in my big book of favorite Orvilles. Number 8. Mitsuharu Mizawa When Giant Baba died in early 1999, the position of All Japan Pro Wrestling president fell to the company's top star, Mitsuharu Mizawa. As Mizawa was a four-time Triple Crown heavyweight champion and one of the most talented wrestlers to ever set foot in a ring, his feud with Vader and subsequent fifth title win wasn't questioned. Friction with All Japan owner and Baba's widow, Matoko Baba, led Mizawa and the bulk of All Japan's roster to leave the company the following year and form a new league, Pro Wrestling Noah. Though several huge names like Kenta Kabashi, Akira Tawe, and Jun Akiyama made the jump with Mizawa, the legendary champion was still Noah's best-known star. He won the company's newly created and epically named Global Honored Crown Heavyweight Championship, establishing the prestige of the belt before he dropped it to Akiyama. He would hold it two more times, recapturing it when business began to slump. Number 7. Vince McMahon. If you're one of those people who try and guess the list before watching, congratulations, you got one. 
I mean, no one believes that you wrote your guesses before the video and you're as bad as the people who write first, but congrats, you got the most obvious answer ever. Anyway, it's common knowledge that Vince McMahon saved his own company by casting himself as WWE's top villain in the wake of the Montreal Screwjob and then feuding with Everyman Champion Steve Austin. Unfortunately, the McMahon character was never quite as resonant when facing off with anybody besides Austin. And when the WWE Champion turned babyface in late 1999, who could ever like this man, decision makers started trying to come up with a new role for him. The result was a feud between McMahon and new WWE Champion Triple H, and getting one over on the game meant that McMahon defeated him for the title on an episode of SmackDown. Vince as WWE Champion was a brief curiosity. He relinquished the belt the following week, and it was put up for grabs in a six-pack challenge match which Triple H won. Well, that was bloody pointless, wasn't it? All in all, McMahon's reign did little, except devalue a still relevant championship. Number six, Jeff Jarrett. When WWE purchased WCW in 2001, many wrestlers were concerned about their future business prospects. None more so than Jeff Jarrett, who had left WWE under, uh, let's just say, acrimonious circumstances two years earlier. Though opinions varied as to who was in the right regarding the Jarrett-McMahon conflict, it really didn't matter when Vince was running the sole business in town and hated him as much as... nodding? Jarrett's options were limited, so he and his father, promoter Jerry, started a new company. Total non-stop action. Initially, it seemed like Jarrett was willing to take a back seat. Ken Shamrock and Ron are truth killings were the group's first two champions, so we we're off to a good start. Before long, though, Jarrett was on top as champ, and that was the promotion status quo for much of the next four years. To many would-be fans who didn't view Jarrett as a true superstar, his prominent position was more of a turn-off than... Number five, Vince Russo. Vince Russo's two separate tenures as head booker of WCW are among the most maligned creative runs in wrestling history. And among many other transgressions, he broke a rule that he'd once set for himself about never appearing on camera. In fact, he just shattered it, becoming an obnoxious New York version of Vince McMahon's heel boss character. I hate him! I hate him! I hate him! Russo's on-screen presence turned off as many people as his booking, especially in a ridiculous feud with Ric Flair, who you might know was rather good. <laughs> Russo didn't stop there, though. This stupid b wank. On the 25th of September 2000 episode of Monday Nitro, Russo faced WCW World Heavyweight Champion Booker T in a steel cage match. Booker T seemed to have the match won, which would make sense when he escaped the cage. But Goldberg, whom Russo had antagonized for weeks, speared the challenger through the cage wall and the WCW Booker hit the ground first, becoming the new WCW Champion. Really? Like McMahon, Russo relinquished the world title days later, but unlike McMahon, Russo's company wasn't strong enough to weather the asinine decision. Number four, Ric Flair. Ric Flair is roundly considered to be one of the best wrestlers of all time, but his tenure as booker of WCW is far more polarizing. Flair is rumored to have had a hand in booking his legendary programs with Ricky Steamboat and Terry Funk in 1989 and was given creative control of WCW outright in 1994. That tenure didn't last long, but Flair, who was already world champion, continued to hold the title until the summer, feuding with Steamboat once more. Flair's creative contributions to the undercard, which continued after he lost control of the main event, were... Let's just say less popular. Mick Foley, who as Cactus Jack experienced Flair's tenure firsthand, criticized him in his first autobiography, famously stating, Flair was every bit as bad on the booking side of things as he was great on the wrestling side of it. Ouch. Number three, Vern Gagne. After a dispute with the NWA in 1960, Minnesota-based wrestling star Vern Gagne and promoter Wally Carbo founded the American Wrestling Association. Gagne, a serious accomplished mat technician, was declared the first champion of the new group and would spend the next 20 years as the promotion's top draw. Even Hulk Hogan would tell you, calm down a bit and let someone else have a go, mate. 
In 1980, the 54-year-old Ganya retired as AWA World Heavyweight Champion, marking the end of his 10th reign with the title. Though Ganya was a great talent and a legitimate superstar to his core audience, it can be argued that he overstayed his welcome from 1960 to 1980. You think? Ganya spent 4,677 days as world champion, a record that stretches across all of wrestling. Obviously. Number two, Triple H. Now, to be fair, Triple H has never been in the position of head booker for a company in which he's competed. He currently holds the slot in NXT, of course. So this is sort of cheating, but it's my list, so go suck a dick, I suppose. He has, as a result of friendships and romantic relationships, found himself with a great deal of backstage influence, though. Just how much of Triple H's success is due to his familial relationship with Stephanie and Vince McMahon will always be debated. Even to the uninitiated eye, though, the game has clearly spent a decade and a half as a focal point of WWE TV, often at the expense of more popular superstars. <coughs> Since 2013, Triple H has settled into a position as a flip-flopping heel authority figure, but those who closed the book on his time as champion were sorely mistaken. In 2016, Triple H won the Royal Rumble, capturing his 14th world title in the process. But it all worked out in the end. Oh. Number 1. Kevin Nash Yeah, sorry to all the Nash apologists out there, like our very own Michael Hamlet. Look at his little face. But look, sometimes when Booker wrestlers put the title on themselves, it is a good decision. Sometimes it's questionable, and other times it's Kevin Bloody Nash. Kevin Nash became Booker of WCW in early 1999, but even before then, the wheels were in motion for him to take the reins, and he was wielding creative influence. In November of 1998, he won the 60-man three-ring battle royal known as World War III, and the following month, he pinned Bill Goldberg to win the WCW World Heavyweight Championship in a match finish most would describe as bollocks. Goldberg, who was still undefeated until the Nash match, had been WCW's biggest draw throughout 1998. And after losing, he was still WCW's biggest draw, but that just didn't carry the same weight that it once did. He was no longer able to keep the company in contention with WWE. Nash killed WCW's Golden Goose to line his and his friend's pockets. And it was one of the largest nails in what would become WCW's coffin. And that's our list. Did we miss any out? Let us know in the comment section below. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And check out our wrestling podcast by searching for What Culture Wrestling on either iTunes or Spotify. Thanks for watching. I've been Adam from What Culture, and I'll see you soon.